Hi, everybody. Welcome to Road TV. My name is Linda J. Han, and I am the virtual faculty coordinator. And today we're going to talk to Diane Murtha. Hi, Diane. Hi, Linda, and everybody out there. How are you? Good. Where, where will you be coming from? Well, right now I am in Bettendorf, Iowa, and that is right along the Mississippi River between the Iowa and Illinois border. Okay, is that close to Fort Madison? Um, uh, no, Fort Madison is uh, a little in the other direction of the state. We're right on the eastern coast of, of Iowa. Ah, okay, okay. So is this your first time teaching for road? It is, and I am so excited to be included with such a great lineup of teachers and lecturers. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be included. I am very excited. Uh, when you asked where I'm coming from, I said right now I'm Bettendorf, but in January we will be in Florida for the winter, so I will be zooming to everybody from Florida then. Ah. Yeah. My first year, I am, um, even though I've been quilting for a long time, I'm relatively new to quilting, lecturing, and teaching. Um, and yes, so this was my first experience with road, and I'm really, really looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm actually in Florida now. The weather's beautiful. Good. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about um, some of your classes. Your first class is a lecture and that's SL04, Peaceful Stitching. Yes. Tell me, what are we gonna see? Okay, well, Peaceful Stitching is about two things. First is the real health benefits associated with peaceful stitching. Anything that we do with our hands that's methodical and repetitious, does have studied health benefits. So you don't have to make up an excuse to go to your sewing room. You can just say, I'm doing it for my health. So we'll talk more about the history there and some of the studies and some of the benefits. But basically as, as you are stitching and sewing, even if it's chain piecing, if, if it's methodical and repetitive, cutting our fabric um, and of course, knitting, crocheting, even if it's baking or cooking or playing an instrument. Um, there are health benefits where, you know, the stress levels come down. There's a reason, Linda, that we call our sewing room our happy place, um, but it's documented in real health benefits. The other part of the lecture is me giving you lots and lots and lots of tips and suggestions and showing you many examples of ways that you can include flow stitching in your quilting or crafting. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a traditional quilter, a modern quilter, or um, an art quilter. There are ways to include flow stitching, either big quilt stitching by hand, a little embroidery work, beading, um, a, a whole lot of things, some unique items. Uh, so I, I give a lot of people examples. I've lectured before and, and some people will say, oh, I, I don't, wouldn't even know where to start to add something new. So I am just giving you lots of examples. I'll also talk about resources, places where you can go to learn some of these techniques. Um, but there's lots of sources, but I'm just going to inspire you and give you some examples and hope everybody will then go out and do some wonderful things. That sounds fabulously relaxing. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, your next quote, which actually intrigued me when we were looking at them, um, S124, that is quilt as you go hexes. Yes, so my husband and I travel by our RV a lot and we'll be in the RV in uh, Florida, but when I'm in the RV, uh, like a lot of people, I like to do things with my hands and you know, can't be running the sewing machine while we're going down the road, not very well at least. Uh, so I look for some hand projects, um, but you know, some hand projects are a little slow moving. I like hexagons. I teach regular uh, English paper piecing. 
but this is uh, a quilt as you go, and it uses a two piece template. Um, and I'm going to show a couple little examples. Um, you make it you either individual hexagons um, that you sew with your machine. And this is an example of um, an embroidered piece. Uh, old our old embroidery that was cut down and hand dyed, and then here's some that um, where you can fussy cut and applique something in the center. I recently also did a whole bunch of just coasters individually. You can, our, my students will call these coasters. They'll call them flying discs. They'll call them frisbees. But you you're making these individually. And then you join them all together, and it can, you know, it can be anything as large as you want. And here's an example, um, and in any color. So I also, um, I don't like to have my students buy anything that is only a one-time use. So with my templates, I will also talk to the students about at least two or three other ways that they can use the templates um, in the hexagon shapes to make things. Now, if you're really truly a tried and true hand piecer, you can do this same tech, the same basic technique by hand. But because of this larger size, they come together very quickly. Um, I taught it once this fall, actually, even through the pandemic, and every student ended up buying two or three extra sets of the templates because they thought, oh, this will be great for my, you know, to give away as gifts. It'll be a great project for me to teach reteach to my my nieces, my granddaughters, um, you know, take to a bee retreat. So it was very popular. I think everyone will really like it. Wow. So what would you say would be the the most important thing that you would like your students to take away from your presentations? Um, that's that's a good question, Linda. Um, I am all about challenging yourself. I have other lectures where I talk about challenges. I was a traditional quilter. I've been quilting for 30 years. And about 10 years ago, I moved to art quilts. And it was kind of by accident. I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I don't have an art background or a design background. So it usually takes me multiple uh, times in a designing something to come up with with something different. But every time I learn something, even if it's I never want to do that technique again. <laughs> <laughs> so when you do a, a challenge project, oftentimes you're working with a smaller size. And for me, and I think a lot of other people, uh, it's a little less intimidating to try a new technique on something that's maybe 20 by 20 or you know, 24 by 24 or 12 by 12. It gives you some confidence to then maybe try it in a larger project. So all of my lectures and even in the classes that I teach, I'm encouraging people to try something new. Again, it doesn't matter what kind of a quilter you are. We all have room to add a new technique to our toolbox uh, to try something new. Um, I even talk about reading articles in magazines. You, you know, you may not think that article is of interest to you or that technique, but I will bet there'll be a tidbit of information that you will gain from it that you might use sometime later. Uh, again, I've had people who've said, oh, I wouldn't even know how to start to modify a pattern or change something. Um, and then they'll listen to my lectures and they're like, okay, Diane, you convinced me. I I'm going to try it. And I don't care what it is you decide to try or do, uh, as long as you are um, improving yourself, learning something new, and having fun with it. And so many times, you know, we hesitate because maybe we're, you know, we have our tried and true uh, go to techniques, and it's going to take us 10 minutes more to try something different. But once we do, we're like, oh, well, that wasn't as hard as I thought it was, or that was easier than I thought it was, and it looks so great. I'm going to do it again. So that's what I try to encourage uh, everybody to do is try something different. Um, it doesn't have to be on a big project, just, you know, a little something here and there. 
So do you do you need any special kind of skills? No, and I uh, it, I often tell uh, a lot of stories about my mistakes and the boo boos I've made, and either how I've corrected them, or how how I've overcome them, or how I then did it two or three and four months four more times to actually get it right and really like it. So no, you it, oftentimes uh, you do not need uh, special skills. You have to uh, be willing to try and be a little creative and patient with yourself. It also helps, Linda, if you have a little sense of humor that you can laugh at yourself and your own mistakes. <laughs> I'm always laughing at myself. <laughs> I, I am too, and my husband will in some of my lectures, I've got some great stories of just mistakes that I've made or comments that my husband has made about my quilting or my mistakes. <laughs> and uh, again, somebody uh, has, come, ladies have come up to me on more than one occasion and said, Diane, I really enjoyed hearing about your mistakes. And I'm thinking, man, I guess I really do talk about all the boo-boos I make. And they say, well, no, you know what? That just lets us know that you're human. And now I'm, you know, I'm not afraid to try it, you know, uh, so that's, that's a helpful thing too. It is. Now let's talk COVID. Okay. What, what's COVID like where you are? Uh, well, here in Iowa right now, it's, it's the, the, the positivity rate on the COVID test is pretty high. Um, our governor is asking us not to gather in larger groups of, uh, I think it was 12 the last time I talked and in, big, in public places, no larger than 25, but in your home. So, so Thanksgiving was a bust. We all ended up staying, uh, our family uh, in, had our individual Thanksgivings. Um, all of my lectures from March through mid fall were canceled and rescheduled. Um, we had some family issues where we were helping with some family um, emergencies, uh, medical emergencies. And so actually that was a little bit of a blessing in disguise, Linda, to have some free time where I wasn't on the road to be able to handle that. Um, like a lot of other teachers, I pivoted and turned to uh, Zoom and transferred my lectures and workshops to a, a virtual uh, presentation environment. And I've had oh, probably a dozen or more lectures and workshops that have occurred since then um, virtually, and that's nice. So what would you say are like the good things, if there's anything good about COVID, because we all had to pivot and learn new things, and, and of course, the, that's right. Yes. So... The, the the bad thing is that a, a lot of folks have been isolated and and alone in an effort to try to stay safe. Um, the positives of going to a virtual environment is that we can still stay connected. We can still talk to anybody anywhere. We can talk to family members. You can Zoom with grandkids. And a lot of quilters I know have overcome their fear of Zoom because they have been Zooming with grandkids and their adult children all across the country. Other benefits of a Zoom environment is you do not have to lug your sewing machine and all of your stuff out of your sewing room, out to your car, back into a sewing, a sewing uh, classroom, and then back home again. Um, and then all your stuff is there. All of your stuff is there. So I've, I've taught classes where somebody says auditions of color and, and they say, oh, but now I see what everybody else is doing. Hold on a minute. I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go pull some different fabric. And it works out great. Um, it usually goes one of two ways. Either we are, we are ahead of schedule because you are working it in your own studio, in your own environment, and there are fewer interruptions. Or it takes us a little bit longer because you are home and you have the dog who occasionally comes in and barks or, you know, the UPS man who comes to the door and you have to go answer the door. But the husband's hungry. Your <laughs> husband's hungry. He pops in and says, oh, I didn't know you were doing this right now. 
Um, but it really, it really works. And um, it, it's, it's been nice, of course, you know, we all had to learn a little something new and, um, you know, it's, it's nice. I think a lot of teachers, you know, like myself too, you know, we offer to do some practice sessions with, with guild members uh, to get everybody up to speed. Usually with classes, we open early and we walk through all, you know, all of the things that you would need to, to make sure you've got your volume and all of that. Um, I miss, you know, well, I can still walk around and see everybody and see their, their work. Um, but I do miss the in-person interaction. Uh, but I've had a lot of fun teaching by Zoom. And I think um, so another advantage too, you know, I, I've gotten uh, requests to teach all across the country. And I'm sure Linda, you have experienced this too. My guild here locally, we are now able to reach out to speakers internationally that we would not have been able to afford to come to our guild uh, ourselves. So it's really opening up opportunities, I think, for guilds to have even more speakers and lecturers because they don't have that travel expense added on. Yeah. Awesome. Now, is there anything else you might like people to know about you? Oh, let's see. Um, you have a, you have a husband. I I do. I have a husband, and I have a standard poodle who is actually out of the room right now. He they both travel with me. Um, I retired from the federal government after 34 years. I took an early retirement to move here to Iowa uh, from Virginia to help my family, and. Um, that has allowed me to be a little more creative uh, with my quilting, which I'm really having a lot of, of fun with. My husband and I were foster parents in Virginia and we are foster parents here, mostly focusing on uh, respite to support other families. Um, let's see, um, I, I did switch into art quilting about 10 years ago. And it has helped me try new things and learn new things, which I'm very excited about. The local paper did an article on um, my quilts. I had two of them at the uh, National Quilt Museum in Paducah, Paducah oh, wow. in October, which, you know, I'm like, oh, it's a great, it's a great opportunity to have one quilt there, let alone two. And I walked in and and the lady says, Well, welcome. And I said, I have two quilts here at the same time. And she's like, what? We've, we don't think we've ever had a, an artist have two quilts in two separate exhibits at the same time. So I felt like a little bit of a celebrity. Um, but uh, the paper did an article about me and uh, the opening lines was a quote where I said, you know, I will probably never win a blue ribbon. And the reason is people who win, they, they master a, a technique, something that they practice and practice on. And I am just so excited about trying new things. Um, and it's reinvigorated my love of quilting that I keep jumping to new projects and jumping to a new technique and trying something different, but I'll never win a, a, a blue ribbon. Um, and that's okay. There are a lot of reasons uh, that we quilt and a lot of ways that we challenge ourselves um, and some things that we want to achieve. And for some people, it's a blue ribbon. Um, and for others, it might be a different form of, of recognition. Um, so, um, yes. so it's, it's definitely fulfilled your life. It has. And, um, you know, 10 years ago, if someone would have said that I would be writing articles for quilt magazines and have quilts in four or five uh, books right now, I never would have believed them. So, that's where I say, you know, you set your goals, anybody can do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, but I've been blessed and I'm just happy to keep playing in the sewing room and trying new things. And it just, it makes me happy. And I get so excited about it that I, I just can't wait to share all of this with other people. And we're excited to have you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. I'm gonna, I'm super excited too. <laughs> now, do you have a website? I do. It's uh, www.dianelmurtha.com. 
And there's a funny story about that. There is another Diane Murtha who was uh, lived near me in Northern Virginia. And the two of us got confused okay, on more than one occasion. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I do have to use my middle initial. Uh, it's in my email and it is in my, my website. It's funny you said that. There is another Linda Hahn who teaches quilting. Ah, uh, yes. I, I think the other uh, Diane Murtha might be a long armor, and uh, so uh, I I checked with her. I'm like, okay, please tell me you have a different middle initial. She said yes. So I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> and that that the other Linda Hahn also has a daughter by the name of Sarah. Oh my God. That I do. Yeah. So I I always use my middle initial. So I get, I get that. Yeah. So what about your social media? Are you on social media? Well, um, slowly, Linda, um, for years working for the federal government, you know, we just didn't, you know, do social media and I had to be very careful about things. So I didn't, um, I am on Instagram and that is Diane L. Murtha. Um, I just recently started posting there and, uh, it, it's kind of like my quilting. It's all over the map. There's some modern things. There's some things where I've challenged myself with UFOs, some hand-dyed things where I'm trying to challenge myself in, in doing something with, with that. And again, I take classes and continue to learn myself. And so I've posted some things where I'm trying some different uh, quilting stitches, um, different, different threads, some thread painting and things. Awesome. That's what we all should be doing. That's what we all should be doing. All right. Well, thank you so very much. I'm looking forward to popping into your class. And um, if, again, we will, let me read off the class. Uh, the lecture is SL04, that is peaceful stitching. And the class is S124, quilt as you go hexes or you can go on the website and search for Diane L. Murtha in the search box and all her classes will come up. So thank you very much for watching Road TV and we will see you next time.